Hey guys, welcome back. We are diving right back into uh, the book of Acts. Uh, we're starting this week, uh, picking up where we left off from last week in chapter 2, verses 22 through 41 is what we're going to cover. Now this week, uh, before we jump into our text, I want to remind us of where we where we were just at, okay? Last week, we saw uh, a crowd um, that were a, a small crowd, 127 people up in the upper room, and uh, they were praying, and all of a sudden, this crazy noise happens, uh, tongues of fire or flames of fire are above their heads, and they're speaking in, in 15 different languages, and it draws a massive crowd. And as it draws this massive crowd uh, that was there for uh, the ceremony uh, for the festival of uh, the harvest of wheat, uh, all of a sudden there's this massive crowd. And, and so this is a moment where uh, they're kind of like, what is going on? This is crazy. Uh, that they, they must be drunk or something like that. Uh, and Peter says, no, they're not drunk. It, it's, it's early in the morning. Uh, instead, he, he tells them, uh, starts with telling them, that this was spoken of. Uh, this is this was that which was spoken of in the old um, book, prophet, prophetic book, scripture of Jeremiah. And so he started with that, and and now he's going to go into um, basically outlining to the people there that um, he's going to bring the main message of Christianity. He's literally going to bring it back to the core message of Christianity. Um, Jesus' defeat of death. But, though this is all about Jesus' defeat of death, which is what most pastors and teachers would, would make this about, I, I had something tug on my heart as I was reading through it. And, and we're in the Christmas season right now, okay? And uh, because we're in the Christmas season, it really stood out to me that, um, that this, that the greatest gift ever given was Jesus. For, the, for our sin, right? However, I want us to take a look today at who is the greatest gift giver. Uh, in this, we're gonna see, and I want you to, to hear this up front because I want you to notice it. it it's it, This was all the Father's doing. And so notice it as you uh, listen and, and I walk through this. Notice that it's uh, the greatest gift giver is actually the Father. And why do I bring this up? Because, um, you know, we're really comfortable with Santa Claus. I mean, he's a jolly old, you know, dude with cookies and candy canes and little elves that are uh, non-threatening, right? <laughs> uh, but at the same token, we do have this visual, or at least a lot of people have this visual of who God the Father is and and. They get that from maybe their um, childhood memories of the Old Testament being taught to them. And, and it was, you know, this hellfire and brimstone father in heaven. And he's, he's just full of wrath and ready to, to beat you with uh, a, not a candy cane, but a cane, right? And, um, and so I want you to see uh, that that is not God the Father that we know from the scripture that you were given a bill of goods in, in a sense, if that's your vision of it. We're gonna see that clearly outlined today. So I wanna dive in um, with this, uh, but let me pray for us first real quick. Father, I come before you and I ask that you would get me out of the way and that Lord, you would uh, reveal yourself through this time. That you would author my thoughts and that Lord, you would Humble me um, and, and remove that which is not of you, Lord. Anything that I say that's not of you, would it fall on deaf ears? And uh, Lord, that which is of you, that it would pierce the hearts of those that listen in a good way, Lord. I praise you and I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's jump right in, if you will. Uh, chapter Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 22, it says, Fellow Israelites, listen to these words. This is Peter speaking. This Jesus of Nazareth was a man attested to you by God with miracles, 
wonders, and signs that God did among you through him. Right off the bat, he starts out with, it was by God that these things were attested to you. That literally, that, that God did miracles, signs, and wonders through him. It wasn't Jesus doing the signs and wonders. It was God, the Father, who did these things through him. And it was God saying, this is how I'm going to show you and reveal to you that he's legitimate. So right off the bat, we see the Father at work in the whole matter. It goes on and says, just as you yourselves know, though he was delivered up according to God's determined plan and foreknowledge, you used lawless people to nail him to a cross and kill him. God, the Father, raised him up, ending the pains of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by death. So again, right there, we see that clearly it was God, the Father's determined plan to do this. Yes, they used lawless people, as he says, the Romans, right? But God, again, raised him up. This was all his plan, that he would literally let him be um, proven by the signs and wonders, that he himself would do those signs and wonders, God the Father, then that he would raise him up after he was put to death. This was all God's determined plan, the Father's plan. Now, Peter has to give some clarity to some things because they're very skeptical of Jesus. Um, many of them were there when they saw him get raised up on the cross and, and uh, died. So they're skeptical. But so Peter is going to give some clarity through some um, some old scripture. He did it with the, the scripture in Joel. And now he's going to do it in some scripture from David. He says in verse 25, for David says himself, I saw the Lord ever before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad, my tongue rejoices. Moreover, my flesh will rest in hope. Pay attention to this right here, verse 27. Because you will not abandon me in Hades, or allow your Holy One to see decay. You have revealed the paths of life to me, you will fill me with gladness in your presence. Now, that was the scripture he was quoting. Now he goes on to say, brothers and sisters, I confidently speak to you about the patriarch David. He is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us today. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn an oath to him to seat one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke concerning the resurrection of the Messiah. So they thought that scripture was about David, and he's saying, wrong. This was about Jesus because he was raised up. And how does he clarify that? He goes on right after that, and he says, he was not abandoned in Hades, and his flesh did not experience decay. Anyone else that can, can look at that scripture and go, okay, that's not David. He's obviously dead and buried. His tomb's here. It's done. That's, that wasn't David. He's clarifying that this scripture was speaking of the Messiah. He wants to uh, give some clarity for the people there because they had misunderstood that scripture. He was giving some, some clarity. Now in 32, he says, God has risen this Jesus. Or sorry, God has raised this Jesus. We are all witnesses of. Therefore, since he has been exalted to the right hand of God and has received from the Father, here it is again, God has raised him up, right? And he has received from the Father, this is all the Father's work here, he has received from the Father what? The promised Holy Spirit. He has poured out what you both see and hear, all the signs and wonders, the flames, the speaking of tongues, for it was not David who ascended into the heavens, but he himself, David, said this. The Lord declared to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemy your footstool. 
Again, he's saying, this is David speaking prophetically of Jesus. Sit at my right hand. That's Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father. Until I make your enemy your footstool. He goes on in 36 and he says, therefore, because of this, in light of all this, therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus. Again, the Father has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. That the Father, his plan was to make him Lord and Messiah. Now, I hope in that section of scripture, it was clear enough that it was predetermined plan by the Father. Um, it was attested to the people by signs and wonders, but it was God who did them among the, uh, the people. It was God who, who, um, who literally uh, raised him up uh, from the grave. Uh, it was the Father who he received the promise through. Uh, this is all the, the Father's work and plan. And why is that important? Because we have this view today of the Father that's not of love, not one who cares about us in the same way we may see Jesus as. But here's the thing. If that wasn't clear enough, I'm going to go ahead and give you another section uh, in Isaiah. Isaiah 53, there's two verses, 10 and 11, that give full clarity to this, okay? So we're going to take a look. It says, but it was the Lord's good plan, not just a plan. He saw it as a good plan. It was the Lord's good plan to crush him, Jesus, and cause him, Jesus, grief. Yet, when his life was made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. Oh, so now we enter the, the, the picture here. There was a reason for this. When he made his, his life an offering for sin, it's because he's going to gain descendants. He will enjoy a long life. When he sees all that is accomplished, when Jesus sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he'll be satisfied. Accomplished. Having many descendants is what he accomplished. Having you and I is what he accomplished. He'll be satisfied. He's okay with going through all that he suffered because he's gaining you and I. And because of his experience, my righteous servant, Father, saying, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous. For he, Jesus, will bear all their sins. This is what theologians call the great exchange. I have nothing to offer but sin, and he has nothing to offer but righteousness. And what does he do? He says, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted as righteous, for us to receive that righteousness that he actually uh, has. And, and he, it's only because he bore all my sin. Now, this was the father's, what did it say? Good plan. Now, this was taking scripture and contextualizing for a people group. You see, the Jews did not have a high regard for Jesus himself. But what they did have a high regard for is the Father. They, they, they had a really high regard for the Father. And so because of that, Peter made it clear. It was the Father who did this. It's the Father who put this in motion. It's the Father who planned it all. So this would be very um, contextualized, specific to them. And this is why we see the result that happens. It says in verse 37, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what should we do? Notice, they're pierced to the heart and it leads to them saying, what should we do? 
there are a lot of churches at this moment that would say, well, you need to get into a discipleship program. Well, you need to uh, start tithing and come every Sunday. Well, you need to do this, 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 do, do, do a bunch of stuff. Maybe that's been your experience. And if it is, I'm sorry. That's not the Father's heart. Here's the Father's heart. And bear with me because there's a word that's coming that, that we need to explain a bit. You see, Peter told them when they were pierced to the heart and said, what should we do? Peter said, replied and said, repent and be baptized. Each one of you in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sin. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you, for your children, and for all who are afar off as many as the Lord will call. With many other words, he testified and strongly urged them, saying, be saved from this corrupt generation. Now, maybe you heard the word repent, and you hear it on the back of your neck, kind of stood up and got a little fidgety. I want to clarify that word. The word actually, in, in our day and age, has been twisted a bit. We have these uh, old preachers uh, that, you know, repent, and they're, they're sitting on street corners and screaming at you, and that's just not what this means. As a matter of fact, the original word was metanoia, and let me give you the clear meaning of metanoia, to change one's ways of life as a result of a complete change of thought and attitude with regard to sin and righteousness. Remember when it said they were pierced to the heart? And they said, what should we do? You see, they were having a complete change of thought and attitude towards what sin and righteousness is in their life. And that will lead to a changed way of life. It first starts in the heart. And then it starts to work out in your life. But let me explain it a little further because there's uh, the word baptize, right? So there's, it looks like there's two things to do. But baptized, actually that word there just means to employ water in a religious ceremony designed to symbolize, doesn't do anything, but it symbolizes purification and initiation on the repentant on the basis of repentance so it's an outward expression of an inward work and it starts with that complete change of thought and attitude with regard to what sin is and what righteousness is why is that important that the changed life comes after that's because he says where you'll have forgiveness of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So notice there's two gifts here. There's the Father's gift of the Son. And then there's the gift of the Holy Spirit. And you see the second gift, the Holy Spirit, um, you're given that gift so that you can carry out the presence of Jesus with you. And he'll teach you how to become the new creation. That's the Holy Spirit's work in our life to literally change us into the new creation that we're called to be. He empowers you to live uh, as witnesses for him in, an, in a corrupt generation. Notice that they were in a corrupt generation. And if you spend two seconds on watching news, you know without uh, a doubt that we are still in a corrupt generation. And so he's going to give you the ability to not only be changed in your ways of, of living in life, but he's also going to give you the ability to be a witness in a corrupt generation. And if needed, it'll also allow you to uh, have the Holy Spirit work signs and wonders through your life to draw attention to Jesus. That's what this is all about in this season. The Father is the best gift giver. 
He gave us Jesus by his plan. He sacrificed him so that he would know that he would end up with descendants, with people, you and I, that would be in his family. That he would give us then the Holy Spirit, another gift to, to literally shift our life and change how we live and change what we're about. And he said he came to give us life and that more abundant. Peace, patience, kindness, gentleness. These are fruits. These are things that will come, self-control. These are things that are going to come about from just walking with the Holy Spirit in your life and allowing him to do a work in you. Now, in this time, at that day, uh, through these words, this is what happened. In verse 41, it says, So those who accepted his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 people were added to them. So, very first church service, so to speak, empowered by the Holy Spirit, no doubt. And we see a massive flood of people having that pierced heart, that complete change of thought and attitude, and it becoming a joyous moment where God the Father received many children into his family. That's the offer for you and I today. I know we're going to receive gifts and figgy pudding and all this stuff that's going to happen and the fat jolly guy uh, is, is coming, right? But let me let you know clearly that there is a, a father figure in heaven who put all these things in motion because he wants to be with you. He wants to love you. And he revealed that through his son. Let me pray for you before we go. And uh, if this is you, you're pierced to the heart by this message, and you're thinking, what should I do? I, I, I would just invite you to repent, to have a change of thought, change of attitude towards sin and righteousness. Lord, I ask that you would lead my brothers and sisters that'll watch this. I pray that you would lead them to receive that gift that you've given Jesus into their life. That Lord, you would give them the gift of the Holy Spirit and that you would empower them to walk in a new way, in a new life. I pray that you would lead them to um, a healthy way of living for them and that honors you. I pray that you would uh, lead them to be around brothers and sisters that can help them walk in this new life. Lord, I praise you for not only those 3,000 that happened that day, but the many that will come to know you through this. We love you. We praise you because you loved us first. In Jesus' name. Amen. Next week, uh, we are going to be diving back in, and I can't wait to be with you guys again. Love you. Bye.